So number 93, the people of the state of New York versus Clarence Roos. Good afternoon, Your Honors, and may it please the court, John Vang for Clarence Rouse. I respectfully request two minutes for rebuttal, please. Of course. Um, numerous trial errors here denied Mr. Rouse a fair trial, and I'd like to talk about the evidentiary rulings here. Um, first, the court wrongly precluded the defense from crossing police witness Stephen Lopez about his lies to a federal prosecutor. The lies was here, here was as follows. During trial preparation with a federal prosecutor in a separate and unrelated Counsel, criminal matter. If we were to find for you, assuming, we were to find for you on the judicial determinations, how much of this would get in as, ma as a result of that? How much was, would these lies, I mean, this would, it would come in. Isn't because it part of the he, basis of the federal judge's decision in terms of credibility? There are both of them, yes. The Williams and Russell both involved uh, a situation where the judge deemed Stephen Lopez incredible uh, because in part, not only because of the facts of those cases, but in part because he lied to the federal prosecutor. So let's stay with that for a second. So assuming comes in um, or no discretion is exercised perhaps here and the argument would be and it goes back and there's a determination that these credibility determinations can be used on cross. What information from those determinations would you suggest would be used? Well, you could certainly, there's a number of things, because the court found him incredible based on the facts uh, of those cases. So you could certainly say, you know, was it true that you claimed to have seen, you know, in the, the Williams case, was it true that you claimed to have seen that the, the back license plate was obscured when in fact it wasn't? You know, was it, would it, was it true that, and it also was it true that you, um, um, you both claimed to have seen this car driving at a certain speed and it wasn't? You could almost ask sounds, about the underlying facts. It almost facts. sounds like you're going to retry the Williams case in this case. Uh, well, you wouldn't be tr retrying the Williams case. And, and the key thing about that is the courts would be able to have the discretion to limit the scope of cross-examination. The court could decide that certain questions are resulting in that, that would, would result so in it, So if the witness admits to the ticket fixing? Sure. Does that, does a, a prior judicial determination with respect to him lying about the ticket fixing come in? Well, or is it enough that he's admitted to the bad act? Well, well, I would just like to clarify, because these facts are, um, the, the issue in the case was that, in, in the Williams case, was that he did not admit that he had lied uh, to, about the ticket fixing to the federal prosecutor, and then he lied to the federal prosecutor. That was the fact that came out of the hearing. Isn't it analytically? Right. It seems he have three steps here. The first is the ticket fixing, right. which he admits to. He admitted that, that he was involved in a ticket fixing scheme. Second is, did he lie to the federal prosecutor about the ticket fixing scheme? And it's been characterized as a misstatement or a lie, depending on how you want to look at it. And the third are the two cases that involve the stops with him and his partner, right. the Williams and the Russell cases. Right. So analytically, those are different things. Right. Ticket fixing clearly gets in. They can cross-examine them about right. that. The lies, I'm not sure if they do or not, but uh, that may be a discretion thing and, and is a stronger case to be made on the two judicial determinations. Isn't that what you're arguing? Isn't that the core of it? Well, yeah, I mean, that, that is the core of it. I mean, the, the key thing to remember here, though, is that... He, I, I would be careful about which questions you're going to ask because a, a Judge, you know, a, a right. Judge Wilson's totally... You, right. You're not going to try the Williams right. case over here. And, and the important thing to remember here is that we're, we're examining what questions the court is going to allow defense counsel to ask, but we didn't even get there. I mean, the point here is that the court never even exercised discretion I, excuse at me, all here. But really isn't the point, and not, not what questions they had to ask, the point is, is that... Was the evidence overwhelming, which it wasn't? This is, a, this is yes. the officer identification case. So that being the case, then uh, are these questions necessary because the key witnesses, their credibility is at stake here? They're absolutely necessary here because the defense was that the officers misided Mr. Rouse. Then, after assaulting him, leaving him with five staples in his head, leaving him uh, his shoulder potentially dislocated, leaving it in a sling, leaving him bloodied, they tried to cover up that conduct uh, by, by, by saying that he actually was the gunman. Um, these uh, acts of testimonial dishonesty, defense counsel should have been able 
able to explore well, but that. But for us, so the question's a little narrower. The sure. question is, 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 not, is not that question, but really, did the court properly exercise its discretion to challenge the credibility of the officers? And the court, and there was no, first of all, there, I, I, would, I would actually uh, maintain that there actually was no exercise of discretion here because the court categorically rejected this line of cross altogether. Is that also true of the 911 calls? The, well, well, with respect to the 911 call, uh, yes, because the court um, categorically rejected the defense's right to cross about the 911 calls because the court deemed them extrinsic evidence of collateral matters. But that is an absolutely erroneous interpretation of the collateral evidence rule. The very issue that the jury had to decide in this case was whether Mr. Rouse was the, gu was the gunman. And to that end, the jury had to believe or decide whether or not to believe the officer's version of the events. The officer testified that after the gunman dropped the gun and ran, he was able to accurately track the gunman, who also was wearing a white t-shirt, accurately track the gunman because there was, quote, no one on the stairs and also, quote, not many people on the street at that time. But the 911 calls disputed that. They described a chaotic event where there were at least 15 to 20 kids um, at that intersection who, who scurry or who flee in different directions after the gunshot was fired. Um, there's also testimony, and there's also the 911 calls also provide that uh, many of these people at the top of the stairs were wearing white t-shirts, which was a key defining trait of the gunmen. So what you have here is the court preventing the defense from, from introducing a version of events that completely contradicted the prosecution's version, but also that supported the defense's version, which is that the police were misidentifying uh, Mr. Rouse. Um, do, do you want to I, I, uh, address at all the analytical framework that you would recommend to the court as to um, uh, how this court should approach uh, uh, these kind of cross-examination problems. Should there's some federal case law that has a more uh, seven-factor test, or uh, um, we have People v. Smith, which is relatively recent by this court, which sets out a framework. So, uh, if, if I'm understanding your 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 the, the yeah, honor's which, question, which, you're relating to the, the prior judicial decisions. How should right. the court analyze that? Well, the second how, certain how we've analyzed it, sure. and how they've analyzed it. You, 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 we would have to do it under one of two basic approaches, what are you advocating? For? Well, Your Honor, I, first of all, I, can I just step back and say that the federal rule is completely consistent with this court's rules governing uh, bad acts crosses. The mm -hmm. court says, actually, in Cedeno, in white, um, that these are just non-exhaustive factors. So the court isn't saying you only look at these. The court says these are factors that the court can consider in its discretion in deciding whether or not the prior judicial determinations are probative and relevant to this particular case. This court is free to accept or reject that, but this court has already ruled in its long-standing case law that a broad range of conduct can be the subject of cross-examination as long as it demonstrates an untruthful bent or shows a, willing, a witness's willingness to place their individual self-interest above society. Um, in deciding whether or not to allow a defendant to cross about that, this court also, like the federal courts, provides the trial court with a considerable amount, amount of discretion in deciding what questions get asked. Um, and it, it always, the trial court never loses its authority to impose lim reasonable limits on cross-examination to ensure that they're sufficiently tethered to this case. So your point is that Either test is sufficient in this case. Either test would be sufficient in this case, but I, I think there's already uh, there's already long-standing precedent uh, in this court um, with respect to uh, bad acts crosses that this court can simply apply, and the and the court can accept or reject what the federal courts uh, have provided. Mr. Bang, if, there's if no I constitutional may, uh, concern because this is not the defendant. It's this is not acts. the defendant exactly. The same constitutional concerns don't apply to prosecution witnesses. Yes. So I'm I'm having a little trouble with your characterization that the Supreme Court didn't exercise its discretion regarding the judicial determinations. Um, and, you know, and I guess it matters to the extent uh, of, of how we review this because, uh, you know, on the one hand, you could analyze it under whether the court abused its discretion uh, versus whether it didn't exercise any discretion whatsoever. Yes. Those analyses may lead to the same result, but analytically it's important for how sure. we were, would rationalize uh, any reversal. I would say, if I could just answer Your Honor's question. So the court, and I'll just quote from the transcript actually, the court said, I don't believe any state court has adopted this. You're arguing a federal principle was a, which is applicable and utilized in federal court. Federal rules are, quote, surprisingly different than state. Uh, cases, uh, and then rejected this line of cross altogether. I would argue that he, that I'm is sorry, a... I'm sorry, I thought one of his bases was that um, 
if you do this, you're really substituting the federal court's determination of credibility right. for the role of this jury in determining right. credibility. But that would apply to every situation where you had a prior determination. Yes, absolutely. And right. I would imagine there could be an instruction to the jury here that you're the ultimate determine. You know, absolutely. You're... Yes. Thank Can you. Can I just before you sit down? Sure. I, I thought in uh, from what you were reading, does the judge not at some point say, "I've considered the white factors," I mean, even though he didn't go through them? I. You're absolutely correct about that. I think in the context, if the, if the court looks at the, the colloquy between defense counsel and the court, the court um, in passing says, yeah, I've considered the factors, but it's more of a brush off rather than a true consideration of the factors. If the court had truly considered the factors, we would expect that the court would have set forth uh, the reasons in the factors, why well, it is that the court did In any multi-factor test, uh, when you're making a quick ruling uh, right. in an evidentiary context of a trial, have we ever said the court must uh, enumerate on uh, the record uh, its analysis of each and every factor? I don't no, think we've said no, that. No, but in examining whether the court actually did that in this case, um, we, we would look at that. And the, and the overarching thing that shadowed over this was the court's ruling that, look, this is a federal rule. It doesn't apply in the state courts. You cannot cross about it. But, but you're not arguing that there had not elapsed enough time for the judge to have considered the factors, right? Between the point in time when the issue is obviously presented to the judge and right. when the judge makes this ruling. You're, you're not arguing that happened in, in minutes or moments. No, I'm not arguing that say, it happened in minutes or moments. Regardless of what right. the judge says on this record, right. it's moments. Certainly, you could not have gone through that right. process. Right, but based on based You're on not the, making that argument. Yes. No, I'm not making that argument. Thank you, counsel. Thank you. Counsel? <clears throat> May it please the court, Robert McIver on behalf of the Bronx County District Attorney's Office. Defendant's primary contention regarding the use of these federal findings in cross-examination is unpreserved and wholly inapplicable to the people's main witness at trial, which is Officer Christopher Lopez. It's also meritless. With respect to the federal cases, the court exercised its discretion by both considering the federal rule and the factors and weighing that against the potential for juror confusion. Those, the potential for juror confusion here with respect to federal findings of credibility is immense. The pr it would have a preclusive but that, then why would you need to exercise discretion? Because in every case, why wouldn't you say, well, this federal judge found this, and if I tell the jury that, they're going to substitute the federal judge's credibility determination for their own and abdicate their role as a jury here? I think that that's always a concern with respect to this issue, but I still think that there's an opportunity to exercise discretion uh, under the circumstances what presented discretion? by discretion? I'm having some trouble seeing what discretion was exercised here, because that seemed to be the main I think the only thing the judge really articulated. Uh, I, I disagree with that because I think that, as was mentioned earlier, the judge had said, "I've considered the white factors." I don't I, think that I they're. I think if you read the record, you know, it, they hand up the case, right, and then the judge says, "I've considered the factors and I'm denying it." I mean, there's no analysis of any factors. There's no, you know, there's no indication there was any real time lapse there. Uh, with respect to that, this was also the subject briefly of a pretrial motion in limine. So those, uh, co those court cases have been put before the court. I think with respect to the court saying, I have considered these factors, it had taken those home essentially and slept on those factors and ultimately had considered and weighed them. Um, I would note, I'm not asking this court to adopt the federal rule. Far from it. Uh, but I do think that this would also be a proper exercise of discretion applying those factors in but, view but of the. So, so, so you're not asking us to, to adopt white, but what about under People v. Smith? That we, isn't there still a problem with this failure to allow this cross examination to go forward? No, because of the third factor under People v. Smith, the potential for juror confusion. Mm -hmm. When we compare the allegations in Smith, Smith involves a situation in which they're putting unproven allegations before a jury. Mm -hmm. A jury is well equipped to handle unproven allegations. It's the essence of what it does. By contrast, when you're asking a jury to look at federal credibility determinations, it's a situation in which it's evaluating an evaluation. And that evaluation is So being you understand put the logic of what you're saying. You're a police officer. You testify probably once a month on a suppression hearing. Yes. If you lie 12 times a year at every one of those, none of that can come in to challenge his credibility? No. Uh, I think that if the court is going to refine Smith to mm -hmm. the situation at hand, I think that there are situations in which there could be an improvident exercise of discretion. Mm -hmm. What we would have to look for is either some form of demonstrably false testimony Well, I or guess here, here's the problem. It's, I don't mean to, excuse I don't mean to interrupt you, but it's, I, I want to stay on this point. Um, the... Uh, 
I can't think of a, of a stronger determination than a determination by another judge, even if it's in a different jurisdiction, about the actions of a person. Why wouldn't that be the best proof possible in testing someone's credibility? Because it involves an entirely different situation and because you don't necessarily have to. No, but the, the question is not, not does it involve a situation, but the question is is, 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 is this a person who's truthful, who's shown regard for the truth in the enforcement of his law enforcement duties? Even, We're not talking about him skip, missing a loan payment on their car. We're sure. talking about a testimony that's given in a court of law. So the problem is, I, I agree with you that this is certainly relevant on those issues. But the problem becomes, how does it come in? So it's relevant. It's material. Um, it, it, it goes to, to the two witnesses who identify the, that are really locking the identification. In Reserved case. as to one, but yes. Okay. Um, well, I think you got Stephen and Christopher Lopez, but okay, leaving, leaving that alone. I think they're both pretty strong on that identification. Uh, and uh, you're saying that none of that can come in because the judge couldn't explain to the jury what these were? Uh, I think with respect to that issue, ultimately, yes, there's a potential for their, maybe they could have handled this with a I mean, lengthy jury instruction. It sounds to me what you're, you're, you're saying is that, the, yes, they're probative, but the prejudice uh, to the people is so overwhelming, uh, we're not going to allow this. Uh, but the problem is uh, that when we talk about that kind of a prejudice versus a probative analysis, that's in the context of uh, defendants uh, and criminal defendants um, and not non-defendant witnesses. And, and, and I think I should be very clear on this point. And, and, and maybe, you know, it's, it's different. Uh, the issue here. is not just that it's undue prejudice to the people, but rather the juror confusion on this point. Well, but, but what, what's, so what's to be confused every... about? The, 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 the point is that the two officers have been found to have lied by two separate federal judges. The judge could limit cross accordingly, could give appropriate instructions. What, what's to be confused about? So limiting cross appropriately, it goes back to the point is how this would come in in this trial would ultimately well, we won't be know. a trial within a trial. <laughs> we don't know at this stage, right? Sure, but it is certainly the potential. I'm mean, just looking at these factors. For example, when we look at the U.S. v. Williams situation, or I'm sorry, yes, U.S. v. Williams. Mm -hmm. So Stephen Lopez's testimony fell short of, of establishing a VTL violation. The court ultimately found him credible, incredible on that basis, as well as the unrelated basis on the ticket fixing scandal. But ultimately, the issue was that those credibility determinations determinations did not matter because this the US Attorney's Office was arguing that this was an objectively reasonable mistake of law how does a jury evaluate that without getting into the nuance on federal criminal the procedure people can argue that in in summation <clears throat> I mean there are all sorts of ways to properly instruct the jury as to how they should evaluate this testimony just uh, you know I, I I'm thinking about if if you have a uh, if you have a, a cleric uh, you know a, a very high up in in whatever uh, religious denomination you're talking about and, and that person is come is testifying on the stand that's for some people the type of testimony that people would would you know, just be inclined to believe, oh, this, this person wouldn't lie. And, and similar to, to me, there's some similarity between that and a judge saying, oh, I didn't believe this, these people. But there are ways, if necessary, to instruct the jury on how they are to evaluate themselves the credibility of the witnesses testifying before them. And if you have a situation here where the defense isn't saying, maybe this curative instruction would help, I don't think it's an abuse of discretion to look at all of that and say, this is going to be a trial within a but trial. But is there anywhere on the record where the people made this argument you just made about the finding in that criminal case being it went to this type of federal law and it didn't translate and then the judge could have looked at that and said, you know, you're right, prosecutor, I think weighing that against confusion to the jury, I would exclude this testimony. It doesn't seem to me that happened. This is like a post hoc justification for I, I a failure think that to exercise goes, discretion. I think that goes back to my original point was that these issues were put before the court in terms of analyzing how this would have come in in this trial. I give the judge credit in terms of looking at that and saying, even though these weren't the exact words that the people were using at that point in time, analyzing the possibility of having these come in would have ultimately both been preclusive and then also to, the, the court was analyzing 
the the potential for how this would have come in. They were they had cross exam. Where, where's sorry. the where's the potential prejudice for the excluded test or excluded cross about the lies to the prosecutor? Uh, sorry, say again. Your Honor. Where, where's the I mean, we've been talking about prejudice from findings, but as to the officer not revealing to the uh, federal prosecutor when asked a couple different times until he's confronted with a wiretap that. He was involved in the ticket fixing. Where that was excluded from cross, but what, there's no. What's the prejudice from that? So, there's there's two issues with respect to that. The first is that the ultimate it goes to the initial offer, but there were two ticket fixing scandals that were widely known in the Bronx, or at least one that was widely known in the Bronx that was prosecuted by my office. That involved bribes and kickbacks, and Officer Stephen Lopez, and the ticket fixing only applied to Stephen Lopez. That he was not involved in that, and that's where the confusion comes but he from. Could, that can always be explained in, in the process of the trial. I mean, this, to, to me, the, the, this is, again, perhaps, I don't know if it's an unusual case, but it, this case centered on uh, basically <coughs> the main evidence that, that this defendant was the shooter sure. came from these two officers. Mm -hmm. Their credibility and their willingness to lie to get to keep from getting in trouble in one way or another is is the crux to me of this case of the, of the defense that's being asserted here that they that they picked the wrong guy and they were a little over eager in how they took him down and now they're covering this whole thing up and they're standing by their testimony and there there's all this evidence that they're willing to lie, that in fact they did lie about what the circumstances were in the chase and all that, and the judge isn't letting any of this in. I, I don't understand why that's collateral here, why it can't be managed in terms of how a judge manages uh, you know, any trial. So with respect to the AUSA conversation, let's assume that I'm wrong as to the initial proffer and the confusion between the ticket fixing scandals. That would still be confusing because it would have been put before the jury devoid of any reference to the, over federal, the federal litigation. So putting that before the jury apropos of nothing is ultimately going to ask the well, jury. Well, couldn't, couldn't that be a request of the judge that if you're going to allow this in, then, then there's got to be a little context here so we know what we're talking about. And ultimately, I don't think that the, the failure to wade into this trial within a trial is an improper exercise of discretion. That, I think, is the problem. With respect to the harmlessness analysis on that, uh, this is similar to the Smith defendant within this consolidated case, People v. Smith, the primary issue that everybody's taking with this case. Here, Stephen Lopez's testimony was fully corroborated by Christopher Lopez, who was not subject to the AUSA testimony. None of the ticket-fixing scandals implicated him, just as in the Smith defendant's case, the error is harmless there because it was fully corroborated by a witness who was not subject to the impeachment inquiry. Counsel, do you want to take a moment and address the 911 calls? Uh, the 911 calls, ultimately, I think the most important factor with respect to the 911 calls is that they did not identify the gunman and they observed a different area from the shooting. They addressed 169th and Clay. This shooting actually occurred going down Clay away from that intersection. It's also not inconsistent with the officer's observation because it was never contended that the basis for the ID was that the defendant was the only person wearing a white shirt. They observed him at close range. They observed his distinct shorts, which I do note are a picture of the shorts are in the compendium of cited materials or at least the defendant wearing those shorts. They are unique plaid shorts. Viewing him at close range and wearing those shorts, that's the basis for the identification. So ultimately, the 911 call was not remotely relevant to the actual issue, which is defendant is claiming that's relevant to identity. It's really not. Thank you, Thank counsel. You, Your Honor. If I could just answer that last point, all these arguments that my adversary is making go to the weight of the evidence. The problem here is that the court didn't even allow us to get that far because the court relied on an erroneous uh, application of the law. Um, I also want to go back to the bad acts uh, piece. You know, all of these concerns about prejudice to the people or concerns about trial within a trial, I mean, these are the same concerns that, uh, that exist in uh, uncharged allegations that this court has already said is the proper subject for cross. Um, 
but and and to my my adversary's point that you know there is no refining Smith to the situation, um, Smith ruled that unproven allegations can be the proper subject of cross. If that's so, then the actual determinations of a court that a witness is incredible as a matter of law certainly uh, should be and certainly is. Uh, a proper fodder for cross under that analysis. Would you agree that if we resolve this case in your client's favor on the uh, cross-examination issue that we don't need to reach the 911 issue uh, because it would be nothing more than an advisory ruling on a retrial? It, to the extent that, the, I mean, the, it, Yes, but but I would also argue too, however, that if this is going to result in a retrial, one of the ultimate issues that would have to be decided is the admissibility of these 911 yeah, calls get a, on retrial. Uh, yes, to we argue that uh, there's yes. no binding uh, a, a ruling uh, on the judge of coordinate jurisdiction for, on that. The the, I, the the final thing I would actually a point uh, uh, respond to is my adversary's point that this was somehow pr uh, partially unpreserved with respect to Christopher Lopez. You know, um, and these are the with respect to the. Um, to the underlying, to the prior judicial determinations. Um, defense counsel had made this point uh, apparent to the court. Uh, defense counsel was under no obligation to renew his objections to the court after the court had vehemently rejected um, defense counsel's proffer. So for these reasons, we ask that the court reverse the order of the appellate division. Thank you.